<clears throat> Hello everybody, how's everybody doing? I hope you're doing fine. I had a conflict of schedules. I was at another place. And unlike God and unlike quantum mechanics, I can't be at two places at once. And so I had to postpone for one hour the uh, class today, the uh, lecture. I hope you'll forgive me for that. I hope it didn't cause too many problems out there. Okay, uh, I'm going to be talking about a little fellow here. His name is Ken Wheeler Dealer. That's what I call him, Ken Wheeler Dealer. And um, Ken has uh, several uh, sock puppets. Okay, he uses, uh, he's been using for a long time, Plotinus Veritas and Spirit of Socrates and Theoria Apophysis or whatever. I like to refer to him as the Tattooed Buddha. Not because I want to, uh, you know, uh, belittle him or uh, do, you know, this is not supposed to be taken as an offense. It's just that uh, he's into Buddhism. Yeah, I guess he considers himself an expert in Buddhism. And he's obviously tattooed. I mean, he's tattooed all over. <laughs> I don't think he's got a part in his body that doesn't have a tattoo. So uh, it's just um, describing who he is. I think it's a better uh, name for him, the tattooed Buddha, than all the other Greek names that he put for himself. And uh, Ken uh, wrote a book. Uh, I think it was 2014 that he published it for the first time. Um, and the title is Uncovering the Missing Secrets of Magnetism. And I want to talk a little bit about that book and also about some of the um, videos that he puts online where he purports to explain how magnetism works. Okay. And so that's what I'll be talking about today. But before, before we get into that, let me quickly review what um, I talked about the other day, which was about the electric universe. Let me just synthesize that, okay? And uh, uh, in fact, I don't even have to do it because someone did it for me. And uh, this guy does not appreciate the electric universe much, but I think he did a good summary of what the people in the electric universe believe and what they stand for. He did a good summary and I did a little synthesis of his summary. That's that's what you're going to see now, okay? So here it is. Uh, this fellow says, uh, gravity exists but uh, for the electric universe, right? Uh, gravity exists but plays no significant role in the universe, okay? This is one of the things that the electric universe uh, proposes or believes in or this part of their theory, okay? Electricity is responsible for virtu virtually everything. Planetary orbits are not due to gravity, but to electromagnetic attraction. Okay? Stars are not powered by nuclear fusion, gravitational confinement. And stars are great balls of electrical discharge. Thermonuclear explosions at stars' periphery triggered by ele uh, electricity heat or electric heat. Um, comets are not dirty snowballs that sublimate um, ice and dust when exposed to solar heating. Comets are dead rocks which experience electrical arcing. For those of you who are aware of what arcing is, just a little flash of Zeus there, you know, throwing his uh, thunderbolt. Uh, electrical arcing when close to a star. Arcing blasts away bits of dust and rock to form the comet's tail. Planetary features like mountains, weather, and volcanoes, and he's referring also to the ones in Mars and other places, are also due to electrical arcing. Okay, so they do everything with electricity. And neutron stars and black holes don't exist. Well, they got one right, at least, you know, that last one there. Uh, of course, uh, um, black holes cannot exist because a black hole is a concept, and concepts do not exist in physics. Only objects can be said to exist. Okay, so I uh, have my own synthesis and my objections to what the electric universe stands for. Let me go with that real quickly here, okay, so we get that over with. And uh, here you can see it. Essentially, uh, electric universe uh, proposes ether, okay? Uh, ether is a medium, according to them, a medium full of particles that serves as background to matter. And that's essentially the notion of ether that has always been around that. It's just a bunch of particles. 
Light consists of vibrations of the ether, and uh, I have a little GIF here. It looks like that. That's essentially what they're talking about. Okay, I showed that last time. You just have a vibration of that, you know, those white dots that are vibrating in the background that form the ether, and light is just a vibration of the ether. That's, that's what they're proposing, essentially. Okay, and then... Um, Electric Universe postulates that filaments interconnect stars and galaxies, and that more or less looks like this. Okay, they love this picture because they say, ah, oh, this uh, um, proves our theory. You know, look at all those filaments going from galaxy to galaxy. What are those? Well, those are the electrical filaments. That's what they say. Or like uh, Well Thornhill says, you know, they, uh, our universe is like a Christmas tree. You know, we have all these light bulbs, okay? Uh, connected to each other. And finally, plasma fills space and serves as the medium for uh, current electrical flow. What are my objections uh, to electric universe proposal? Well, first, space is not a medium. Space is a synonym exactly of nothing. What is nothing? Well, it's the opposite of something. What is something? Uh, it's uh, that which has shape. And uh, synonyms are thing and object. What is nothing? Nothing is an antonym of something. So if you say something, what is nothing? Well, it should be an antonym. It should be exactly the opposite. And that's what it is. It's that which doesn't have shape. And synonyms are vacuum and void. Now that we have two good definitions, two solid scientific definitions, we can use them consistently in any discussion and people can follow what we're saying. Something is the opposite of nothing. Okay? And uh, we're going to identify space with nothing. Therefore, space is not filled with particles, okay? Because space is not a medium. It's not a container. Space is that which doesn't have shape, so it cannot be filled. You, you can fill a container. You can fill a bag. You can fill a balloon. But you cannot fill that which is not a container, okay? So space cannot be occupied because there is no such thing as space. You're not displacing uh, regions of space every time you put a, a you know put an object in there when the moon moves around it doesn't displace space because there's nothing to displace literally okay and there's no such thing as ether no such thing as fields no such thing as waves no such thing as electricity no such thing as vortex or plasma and you say Bill what are you saying what do you mean there's no such thing as fields and waves and vortices and so on yeah, that's exactly what I'm saying. And uh, the way we do this in science is, as you can see on the uh, lower left there, um, all of these are things that are already in motion. The job of a physicist is to identify what it is that is moving. A, um, a thing, for the purposes of physics, an object, is a photograph. You should be able to visualize it in a single image. If you're watching a movie to understand what you're staring at, that thing is not a thing. So vortex is a tornado. What is a tornado? Is it is it the one that is that that thing that blew down your house? That's in ordinary speech. Okay, in ordinary speech, you can say, "Tornado blew down my house." It was the tornado that caused my house to fall. That's ordinary speech, not scientific language. In in scientific language, you have to identify the object. The object is known as air. You can call it a molecule of O2. You can call it an atom. Those are objects. And this object called air or O2 or atom hit the silicon atom that formed my bricks. So now you can talk about atom hitting atom. Now we're, we can all follow your presentation because you're saying the atom of air uh, came with so much force, blah, 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 and hit the atom of silicon blew my house away but you cannot say the tornado did it because there's no physical object called tornado not in physics in ordinary speech not in physics so that's the issue the issue has to do a lot with language and no i'm not piddling with language i'm doing physics i'm telling that you cannot use certain words as objects in physics you cannot say love moves mountains in physics you cannot and you might say well you know love is you know, what is love? Is it a heart? I mean, I can say a heart moved the mountain. I can't say that love moved my mountain. Okay, and that's the point. 
it, language is very crucial here to understand physics, not ordinary speech, but physics. People have a problem with that, okay? So you have to understand my language in order to understand what I'm talking about, and that's my language. My language is a language of objects. Objects can do stuff in physics, concepts cannot. And when you have a dynamic concept as a vortex, vortices plural, you cannot say, I move the vortex. No, because you can move an ice cream cone, but you cannot move a vortex because vortex is already in motion. It's like I say, it's a jumping kangaroo. Kangaroo is the object, jumping kangaroo is not an object. It's already an object that is in motion. That's the issue. And, you know, a lot of people have mental blockades there and they can't understand this simple, simple concept. Okay, so um, essentially my uh, objections have to do with these people moving dynamic concepts. And that is irrational for the purposes of physics. In fact, that is the first criterion uh, for the definition of what we were going to call irrational. An irrational theory is one that the, uh, primarily, okay, there are several criteria, but this is the first criteria, probably the most important one. It's the movement of concepts. If you move a concept, you have an irrational theory, period. Okay, you can't move concepts in physics. For that, you need to determine what a concept is for the purposes of physics. Okay, okay. so um, what is the issue? The, the issue is that uh, some people, uh, in fact, uh, this lady I've been talking about a little bit in the last couple uh, talks, uh, fractal woman, fractal lady, um, you know, she, she vouches for, or she does her physics with... <laughs> Tornadoes. She does them with um, vortices, with vortex. And what is this vortex in her theory? Well, it's two particles that twirl around each other. Well, two particles twirling is not a physical object. You cannot say, well, I'm going to get rid of the particles now, and I'm going to do the rest of my presentation with a vortex, with a tornado. No, no. If you're going to do physics, you've got to do it with the air, with the air molecule, with the air atom, uh, the uh, oxygen atom. You gotta have an uh, object there. You cannot say, I have an object, and I have a jumping kangaroo, and I'm gonna do my physics with jumping kangaroos. And that's what a vortex is. That's why you can't use the word vortex in science. It belongs strictly to religion. Anyone using the word vortex is doing religion, okay? They're not using objects. They're, they're, they have a dynamic concept which they're using in lieu of a physical object. That's where the irrationality irrationality comes in and uh but they don't stop there uh this lady was called the fractal woman because she likes fractals and if you look at, throughout the internet you'll find a lot of dissidents out there people who are on the fringes and they talk about fractals in fact a lot of mainstreamers do too and uh you say what is this fractal thingy you know what is this and uh you'll find above all you know for visualization you'll find fractal art and it looks something like this and you, you can google it yourself i did a google of images and just put fractal and this is what i got and i just took a picture of that okay for for today and this is what it looks like they look like these nice cute patterns and uh for art's sake you know I'm nothing wrong with them i mean i like art to some degree i'm, I'm not into art but uh, once in a while, I like to go to the Louvre or to the uh, British Museum or, um, or to the Vatican, the uh, uh, Sistine Chapel. And they have beautiful uh, pictures, for, in, in my taste, okay, uh, of the Renaissance. And most of them are portraits, you know, people who really uh, had good uh, skills in painting and so on. And I admire a lot of that. Uh, I like that a lot more than this abstract art such as vortices and there's nothing wrong with vortex art with uh, with this uh, fractal art and uh, what you have to understand that a lot of these patterns let me put that up there again for a second a lot of these patterns you know some of the ma mathematicians out there have gone in there and they um, and what they've done is they said look uh, you know we can put an equation that describes uh, that motion you know if you repeat the equation get all these values then you can create these patterns and so, the, you know, people have, with very little to do, you know, uh, they go out there and, and uh, create equations that, you know, can create these patterns in a mathematical way. Nothing wrong so far. No problem there. Let me tell you where the problem comes in. 
comes in at two levels. The first problem is when people say that they can see meaning, meaning in these, uh, or interpret meaning in these vortices, in these fractal art, in this fractal art. That's the first problem. And, uh, and um, part of that problem is that they come in, they say, look, the ancients, they had all this knowledge, and then we lost it over the years. Today, we don't have that knowledge. We have to dig it back up again because they knew all this stuff in the old days. We, modernism, you know, et cetera, we forgot about all this or we lost this knowledge. Okay, so that's the first problem. The second problem, and here we get into serious stuff, that's when they cross the line into the asylum. Okay? They, they become, they go into idiocy. They go into retardedness. And that's when they start putting this stuff into physics. They bring it into physics. They say, oh, fractals, oh, fractal geometries. And, okay, now we're, now we're talking major stuff. Fractals have nothing at all whatsoever to do with physics. So anyone using the word fractal is not doing physics. You want to find meaning, and there is some meaning, by the way, like from a political standpoint, there is some meaning in, in these patterns. And not only these, there are many symbolisms out there. You know, uh, you take the Masons, you know, they have their little symbols there. And you say, well, does that mean something? Well, they, it probably does it to some degree. I mean, these people copied it from someone in the past that used it for something. And for them, this becomes a symbol. I mean, what is the swastika that Hitler used? It's, it was the sun. At least in some cultures, they used it as the sun. And so they took that and used it as the Nazi symbol. So, so there is some symbol, some symbolism. And you can use that in politics, for example, or if you're going to form a club or whatever. No problem. But if you want to bring that stuff into physics, and now you cross the line into the asylum, okay? Now, now you're talking nonsense. And that's the problem here. And uh, so we get with that to... Uh, Mr. Ken Wheeler, he does a little bit of symbolism. In fact, um, here you see it. Uh, he uh, wrote um, a little book which he uploaded, which is aside from the book about magnetism. This is another book which he uh, talks about Pythagoras and he talks about, I think, Plato or whoever, you know, and uh, he did, a, I didn't read the article, I just took a little piece of it and, and the piece that I took is this. And you can see here, uh, uh, the tattooed Buddha, and he, he, he does look for meaning into all these, uh, these uh, geometric drawings. And he's got a couple more. I just put this as an example. So he's into symbolisms. And he, if he is a Buddhist, I don't know if he is or not, okay? Uh, I'm not saying he is a, a Buddhist, but he claims to be an expert in Buddhism, okay? That's the point. And so he, he brings this stuff up, and uh, so he's into symbolism, into hidden meanings, into um, uh, interpreting what the ancients knew for sure. He, he does bring a lot of Greek stuff, Greek philosophers. He says, oh, these guys knew all this stuff. We lost this knowledge, and now we revived it again, and they knew this stuff. And the quantum guys, they changed all that. He goes into all this, you know, this uh, argument. And also Buddhism and Hinduism. He, I think he translated the uh, Pali uh, book from the East. Uh, so uh, he's into this stuff. He's into this uh, esoteric uh, religions and whatever. How much he believes, I don't know because I haven't researched that. All I'm saying is that he does bring symbolisms in there. So he's got this thing in his mind, like the fractal woman, which, by the way, is... Uh, you know, he is to some degree in cahoots with him. She, she does accept a lot of his stuff, and she, he accepts a lot of her, her stuff, so they know each other. I didn't know that until recently. And, um, and so they both have these secret meanings that uh, they try to look into, you know, these patterns, into these vortices. And uh, for them, it has some meaning other than, you know, just the little art there. Okay, that's the point that I'm trying to make. And because it's associated with math, they bring that in there. And because they're going to do their um, explanations, I, I think you could call them that, they're really descriptions, they're going to be doing their, their, interp their physical interpretation with these vortices. So for them, they have to, you know, they have to bring them into physics somehow. They, they have to say, this is not just math and this is not just uh, abstract stuff. We're going to explain how this universe works with these tornadoes, okay? That's the point. 
And that's when it gets dangerous. Okay, so um, uh, one more thing I should mention is um, Ken Wheeler, he's got a lot of followers. He's got 185,000 subscribers. And I got very few in comparison. And you say, well, Bill Z, his theory must be more, <laughs> more correct than yours because look at all the followers. He's, yeah, you don't have followers, you know, okay. Um, what can I say? Uh, yeah, he's got a lot of followers. I'm sure a lot of people envy his followers. They would like to have as many followers as, as Ken has. Uh, the question is whether I would trade my 20, my handful of followers for his 185,000 followers. That's the question. I mean, you know, you can have a, a bunch of nuts following you and, uh, I mean, you know, and they contribute to your, uh, to your pocket. Great. I mean, you managed to convince a whole bunch of people to throw in their pennies to, to keep you afloat. I mean, kudos to you because you, you did a good job as a businessman. That doesn't mean anything. It doesn't reflect at all on your theory. And here's an example uh, I pulled up so that you can see what I'm talking about. I'm sure these guys, you know, these are all, uh, <laughs> these are all uh, famous uh, charlatans of religion. You have uh, there Jimmy Baker, and he... He went in there and uh, he went to prison for sticking his hands in the cookie jar. And he had jets. He, he has a lot of money. And uh, I still think he does. He came out of prison. He started again with his evangelistic uh, propaganda. Uh, you have Jimmy Swagger. He, he screwed about every prostitute, you know, he could find, at least in Louisiana. Okay. And, uh, and so he, that's his house down there in Louisiana, his mansion. He's got a jet. Uh, on the lower left, you find this other guy, you know, he, uh, Kenneth Copeland, uh, and he's got uh, a jet as well. That's his jet there. On the lower right, I like this guy. He's my favorite because Jesse uh, here, he's, uh, he asked for more money. He asked his uh, followers, give me more money so that I can buy a faster jet so I can take the word of God around the world <laughs> faster. And then on the upper right, you got this African guy. I don't even know who he is, but I found him on the internet. I thought it'd be interesting. Uh, not only does he have a jet, but I like the fact that he's got two white slaves. You know, the world turned upside down. It used to be the other way around. The whites uh, would capture blacks and turn them into slaves. He, he, this guy did it in reverse. He made millions and now he hires white people. So I thought that was interesting. Well, these guys, I think, make a little more money than uh, and have more followers, much more followers than uh, Ken. And <laughs> so uh, does that make their theory more correct or does it mean they were able to, uh, uh, you know, uh, bamboozle more people than, than Kenny does? That's the issue. So uh, keep that in mind. That's, that's the context. Uh, if you're going to say, look, uh, science is about democracy, and the more votes you get, the more correct your theory is. I think you're mistaken. Okay? And think about that. That's also in the background. Okay, let's get to Kenny. By the way, I, uh, today I'm just going to give an introduction on Kenny because there's so much material that i got to cover. There's no way I can cover it today. I'm going to do something today, uh, at least cover one subject so that you get that real good, okay? And then I'm going to continue on Wednesday. So uh, it's at least a two-part series, maybe three. I don't know. We'll, we'll find out. But um, yeah, let's start with this. Um, who is Ken Wheeler? Well, I can tell you how I came across him. Or better yet, it was the other way around. He came across me. Okay? And that was about six years ago, for sure, five years ago. But he probably was there following uh, my videos uh, already for about six years ago. Okay, and um, at first, you know, when, when you see someone who attacks the mainstream like he does, he says, oh, this guy's like me. He's attacking the mainstream. He's attacking relativity and he's attacking quantum mechanics. So I like this guy. And, that's, and he came in my defense. I want you to know that. So he, he puts a comment in my first video, first video that I ever uploaded to, uh, to uh, uh, YouTube. And he answers a guy there and says, you're a goddamn idiot. Gating is right. You're a buffoon. Okay? And that was on video number one on the uh, one uh, about the um, what's the point. OK, then he goes on to to a second uh, to another video. I think it was the fourth one here. Yeah. And he says there, he tells me that he bought my book. He says, keep up the awesome videos, old coot. 
Bought your book. Great stuff. Keep kicking the ass of these relativity scumbags. Okay? So, you know, um, uh, he, he made these comments. Uh, he went into uh, my uh, videos and he liked what I was saying because I was, uh, you know, uh, railing against the establishment. And he found common ground there, no doubt about it. And he bought my book. And he read the book just about, in fact, just before he published his. And uh, good old Ken, he borrowed a lot of stuff from my book. And first of all, he did not give me credit for it. And then he only borrowed the stuff that he used against the mainstream. He did not borrow any of the stuff related to the rope model, what I proposed in, in, in exchange. He didn't put any of that in his book, but he put a lot of other stuff. Okay, let's look at the stuff that good old Kenny borrowed. <laughs> let's look at what good old Kenny got. This, these are some of the quotes that, uh, let me put this up here. These are some of the quotes that Kenny got. Um, and look at the one in red there. You can see that he's, um, he's gone in there and he puts quotes. He puts Tesla, he puts uh, Susskind, Bohr, Feynman, and he quotes also D uh, Dollard and uh, some other people. He quotes a lot of people. But you can see that the statement there, the one that it's in red, he doesn't put who, who said that, who mentioned that statement. He says, you can always recognize a relativist. They will either ask you for your credentials or offer their credentials without you asking for, uh, uh, asking for or about them. And if you go to my site, to my youstupidrelativist.com site, you'll see the statement, you recognize a relativist because the first thing he asks you, uh, asks you is, what are your credentials? And then if you go to video number six, did you ever take math, you'll find almost uh, verbatim you will recognize a relativist because he either asks you for your credentials or volunteer his without you asking, okay? And uh, if you go to the bottom now, bottom left there, page 16 in, in, um, in Wheeler's book, he says, Mother Nature has never taken a course in math. Where did he get that? Well, he, <laughs> he obviously got that from me, and I know I've said that in many ways over the years, but this is one uh, also from uh, uh, video number four, and he says, in physics, we have no use for numbers. Mother Nature never went to school, blah, 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 okay? So, you know, I, I had already mentioned that, and he liked those, and he put them in his book. Here's uh, another one, page 12 on the uh, right-hand side. Physics is the science of existence. Now, where did he get that? Well, if you go to my book, uh, page 461, I say it clearly, I say physics is not only the science of objects, physics is more properly defined as the science of existence. Physics deals with what is. Physics deals with objects that have location. And, um, and in fact, if you go to my site today, okay, if you go to my site today, you will find the summary of principles, foundations, and definitions of science and physics. You'll find that uh, on my first page of the old uh, stupidrelativist.com. So you look up for the old, you go in there, you'll find that statement, you go in there and you'll find in point number seven, physics only studies objects that exist. Physics is the science of existence. He took that right directly out of there. And exist is a word that I could continue talking about exist. Okay, uh, uh, Kenny has no right at all to talk about exist. Not because he stole it from me, I don't care about that. <laughs> uh, but because he never defined the word exist. See, I define the word exist. I define the word object. I define what exist means. So I can say, look, now that I've defined all these words, let me tell you in your face, physics is a science of existence. Kenny cannot say the same thing because Ken never, he, he can, doesn't even know what the word exist means today. So he cannot say that physics is the science of existence. He just took that. He said, oh, I like this. It sounds nice. And he put it in his book. <laughs> okay. And uh, let me mention a couple more here. Um, he went in there and he uh, takes these two pieces, says, field, a re and, I, and watch, uh, notice that he quotes them, okay? He's got them under quotation. Field, a region of space, region, a portion of space, space, the infinite extension of field. And then he continues, a region is not equivalent to the thing occupying the region itself. For those who have the book, to page 287, you'll find uh, that verbatim, and in 289, you'll find it also verbatim. So he took these things. He never gave me credit for it. 
and uh, you, you know you say, well, Bill, you're you're just upset because he didn't give you credit. <laughs> No, it's quite the contrary. Believe me, uh, I'm glad he didn't give me credit because people might confuse his theory with mine. And certainly we don't want that to happen whatsoever. So I'm glad he did not give me credit. I'm just pointing out how devious he is. He, he goes in there and he puts stuff that he took from my book and he doesn't give me credit. And the point for that is not that he did not give me credit. It just shows what kind of character he is. Okay, let me show you a couple more. And this is important to know what kind of individual Ken Wheeler is, this tattooed Buddha, you know. Here, here, he, here is, look, look at what he points here. Oh, sorry, wrong one. Here it is. He goes in there and uh, he takes from two of my videos. The first one, you can see the pictures are almost identical. In fact, they are identical. He just took it from my... Uh, uh, video 10 why can't you draw an atom and he put it in there in his book and here's the other one he's uncovering uh, missing secrets of magnetism page 196 and he took that directly out of my video he put it <laughs> I mean, he didn't even take the trouble of modifying or anything he just put it in there so he used a lot of my stuff and and again I, I haven't gone through this whole book and let me tell you why it's an unreadable book you simply cannot read it it's, it's unreadable. Not only does he have run-in sentences and that kind of stuff, but that I can deal with, but there, you can't make sense of it. I've never seen a book, never read a book that I couldn't read. <laughs> Even the Bible makes more sense than his book. And that takes me to the other point, and that's my thesis today. That's what I'm going to talk about today. And listen carefully. This is my conclusion, my personal conclusion, okay? Okay, my personal conclusion after doing a couple days of research on his book and his uh, videos. I'm saying that Kenny specifically, specifically, does not want you to understand his theory. Let me repeat that. He deliberately, willfully, does not want you to understand what he's talking about. Okay? He does this on purpose, both in his videos and his book is, is like his videos. <laughs> he just jumped from one subject to the next, always repeating the same thing, always with fancy words, words like incommensurable and, <laughs> and uh, uh, counter space. You say, oh my God, that went over my head. I, what is he talking about? He must be a genius. And nowhere do you find definitions of any of these terms. That's what I want to talk about today. You know, when you, when you go to a definition, you expect, you know, the word, whatever the word is, colon, followed by some kind of definition. That's the normal, the rational way of doing it. That's one issue. And the other one is you put it at the beginning of your book. I mean, if it's going to be important, if you're going to be using this word over and over and over again like Kenny does, you want to know what it means, what it means to him. At least you can follow his presentation. Well, you don't find that. You don't find a single a single formal definition, word, colon, followed by the definition in his entire book. There's no such thing in his entire book. And you won't see it in his videos, of course. And one of the reasons for that is that he doesn't want to be pinned down. If he defines a term, followed by colon, formally, and then he uses it like he uses it in his book and in his presentations, you know, in different contexts and changing the meaning of it inconsistently, then you're going to say, hold it, you, you defined it as this, now you're using it as that. So he doesn't want you to catch him on that fib, on that lie. And so he doesn't define his term. In fact, he, he constantly redefines the terms over and over again. I went through, uh, it was just murder on my brain. I had to have two beers to really, you know, dumb down to understand what he was trying to say. And if you go in there, you look at, just look at the word, like counter space, he uses it constantly, incommensurable, he uses it over and over and over, just to uh, uh, ridiculous levels. And you say, well, what does he mean by these words? And nowhere do you find a definition for it. And in fact, in, you find that he's got different definitions in different contexts. And that's what I want to go over. And again, I'm, today's just the introduction. I'm not going to be able to cover all of it because I got to cover the word field. I got to cover several things that he, have vortex and so on. Uh, let's just go step by step. Let's see how much I can cover today. 
Okay, uh, what is it? One thing that did upset me is that he did not mention the rope model. Not upset me, I mean, it really doesn't matter. But it was, uh, uh, it gave me an idea that he feared Bill Gates to some degree. I mean, why wouldn't he give me credit? Why wouldn't he mention the rope model if it's a different model? Look, look at what he says in, a, in his book, okay? And this is where, where we can start. Uh, he says this, uh, what is it, on page 15, he says, As today, as was before, there are only two explanations for magnetism. One materialistic and mechanical, okay, and, um, and as above, uh, evoking particles, nonsense, reifying space as a mediator, and the other, immaterial, based in fields, the ether, Platonic, and Pythagorean uh, in nature. Okay, and of course he takes the second version, the immaterial, and that's going to say a lot about him. Again, shows that he's a Buddhist. Uh, in my opinion, he seems to be a Buddhist. He, he's into that kind of world. He wants to do his physics with immateriality. He has no, no matter in, in his entire theory. There is no matter in there. And that's what he wants to convince you of, that the, this universe is matterless. There is no matter there. What is it? It's all these are manifestations of the ether. And so you have to get down to the bottom of, you know, what he means by ether, and specifically by counter space, which he equates with the ether. So all this is important to understand his terminology because he's invented a new language, okay? Now, you might say, Bill, you've invented a new language too. You use words that you've circumscribed in such a way that they're not exactly like at least the ordinary speech. They have different meanings in physics, the way you're using them. Yes, I have a new language. So I'm not going to deny it. Uh, I call it the language of physics. You may object to that. You say, I don't agree. Fine. But this is the point. First, I define at the beginning, of my, like in my book, I define it at the beginning. Okay, so you have the definitions first, then I use them. Kenny doesn't do that. But then, my, my definitions are crisp and understandable. Object, which is a key word that I justify why I need the word object defined, that which has shape. I mean, I don't go through all this verbiage and say, blah, 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 and you say, well, what did he mean by object? No, I'm saying, look, an object's that which has shape. And it's not the definition of ordinary speech, which is, that which you can touch, that which you can see, that which you can move, uh, has volume, mass, none of that is a, uh, 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 scientific or physical definition of the word object. Object, that which has shape. Anyone who does not understand that is really just being, you know, uh, a devil's advocate, an extreme devil's advocate. What is nothing, that which doesn't have shape. What is distance, separation between two objects. Anybody can understand them because they're concise, to the point. None of that you will see in Kenny's book. You won't see anything like that, not even remotely. And let me show you some examples here. Okay, here, uh, uh, let's start with what he does on the, on the uh, why, he, why these words are needed to be defined, because that's how he's going to explain magnetism. That's, that's where we start, okay? In a video, I think it's video number two in his series, he goes with this. He says, look, these are centrifugal at the edge of every magnet and returning centripetal. Okay, fine, whatever that means. This is centripetal. So he draws these lines, these arrows. This is inertial, and this is counterspatial, whatever that means. Okay, so, and, and radial. Okay, so, so we need to find out what all these words mean. He says, just like a flywheel of a gyroscope. And he points, puts a gyroscope in front. Okay, and he goes over that uh, in different ways, like he does this like three or four times. And just when you're saying, okay, that's the description, fine. Here you, here you have the counter -spatial, spatial, whatever that means. Here you have the inertial, whatever that means. Okay, fine. He labels them. That's just a description. And so now you're saying, okay, now he's going to go into the explanation. The next thing he does is he raises the board completely. And he says, I hope you understood. <laughs> so, uh, uh, used car salesman, that's Kenny. He's a used car salesman, okay? He's bamboozling you. You know, you, you ask a question uh, to the used car salesman, uh, 
is the motor okay? Is the oil leaking on this car? And he goes, blah, 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 blah. he mumbles something, and then says, but look at these wheels. And look, the, uh, the uh, windshield wipers are working perfectly. You know, he's a used car salesman. He, he distracts you from what you really want to know. And so there's no way you can understand what he's saying. So those 185,000 subscribers, they don't understand squat for sure, because not even Kenny understands it or can explain it. And, and he cannot explain because he doesn't define his terms and he uses them inconsistently. That's why he doesn't understand them. And so those 185,000 subscribers, you know, they're, they're like the uh, people who follow the religious uh, charlatans of, uh, you know, these uh, guys who make you wave your hands in the air, you know, and so tell you that you're saved. Okay, that's the same thing. And that's what Kenny's doing. Okay, so um, uh, here's Kenny. He says, after saying that, he says, that's why you need these words. Because in his book, he goes like this. He says, he says, look, this, it is impossible to understand the most fundamental ether modality, okay? Dielectricity, look at the words he uses, okay? Uh, just keep in mind what words he's, he's throwing at you. Without a firm grasp of counter space, okay? So apparently, and I put down, down at the bottom the words that, some of these that I highlighted because uh, we need to find out what these words mean because that's what he's going to be using to explain supposedly uh, how a magnet works. It is likewise impossible to understand magnetodielectric incommensurable field conjugation without a firm grasp of dielectric inertia. Man, he blew me away with that. I said, oh, this guy must be a genius. Okay. Okay, so which is centripetal, counterspatial radial and has no magnitude of its own accord except in divergent discharge as magnetism. Another ether modality and coke principle conjugate with dielectricity together of which both are two fundamental ether energy modalities of the universe. My God, I said, this guy is a genius. Forget about Einstein. And so I said, well, I said, let, let's look up some of these words. Let's see what he's referring to. Let's see, you know, maybe somewhere he's defined them and we just need to find out what they mean. You know, I mean, that's that's essentially what I, the little job I did uh, with his book. I mean, you're trying to understand the theory. What is he proposing? Okay, let's find out what these words mean. Okay, and uh, and the word the, the first word I'm going to look at is this word counter space. What in the world is counter space? And at this point, I'm going to have to ask you to get a beer because you're not going to understand it unless you dump down a little bit. Okay, so so. <laughs> Go get a beer. I'll give you five seconds, and I hope it's close to your, to your screen. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, that's it. If you didn't get the beer, I'm sorry, okay? I'm, I'm going to drink a little bit of mate because I'm going to need some help here. What the hell is counter space? And bear with me, this is not his definition. Since he doesn't define the term, I had to go out there and look it up and say, what in the world is counter space, you know? And I liked one guy who said, you know, counter space is what you, have, what you need in the kitchen. <laughs> you have counter and you need more space, that's counter space. Yeah, that, that, that's probably the best definition for counter space. But what, what happened? Uh, I looked it up, and this doesn't mean that he subscribes to this definition, but this is one of the definitions you'll find on the Internet. I'm just going to make it easy for you so that you, you don't rack your brain out there trying to find what is counter space. Let me make it simple for you. What has happened? What has happened? Since the days of the Greeks, to so this day today, all the idiots, the morons, the retarded morons of geometry, of mathematics, and yes, idiots, morons, stupid idiots of geometry. What they have done is they equated the word space with solids. Okay? Now, I knew this already from high school. I knew they, it always shocked me. They said, well, what do you mean space? I thought, that's a sphere. And they said, yeah, that's a three space. Yes, yeah, three dimensions, so it's a three space. It's space. And they use the word space as a synonym of solids. So the question always popped in my mind, you know, in the background until, you know, I started looking more deeply into this. So, well, you have a cube in the middle of a space. It's the only object in the universe. If the, if the cube is space, what the hell is the black stuff that gives contour to it? Yes, you guessed. That's the counter space. 
<laughs> okay, so, but it doesn't stop there. Let's go deeper so that you really understand what these people have done with this word counter space, which just blows your mind away, okay? Uh, what have they done? Imagine you're in a balloon, okay? Just bear with me a minute here. You're in a balloon, and you're in the center of the balloon. And you're looking at the balloon, you see this curvature, okay? You're looking at the curvature of the balloon from the inside, from the center of the balloon. The balloon grows on you, okay? What happens with the curvature? Well, the curvature gets flatter and flatter and flatter the more the balloon expands until at some point at infinity, all you see is a straight line. You say, oh, okay, now, and remember, you're in space because the balloon is space. So what's on the outside? Well, you have counter space. Where does that take you? It takes you into a division of two halves of the universe. Half of it is space, the other part is counter space. That's what they end up with. And here I've illustrated it so that you can see, follow exactly what I'm saying, okay? So no bullshitting here. Just look at the picture and you'll find out what's happening. Uh, okay, let, let, for, let, let me first show you this uh, so that I justify what I just said. See, here you have uh, introduction to geometry on the internet, and they start with point, okay, then they go with line, then they go with plane, and then they go with solids? No, they go with the word space. They say a space, a space extends infinitely in all directions, infinitely. You can see what geometers have done with the language. And is a set of all points in three dimensions. You can think of a space as the inside of a box. Okay, so uh, let's assume that's true. Okay, we're, we're going to assume that it's the inside of the box. Let's remove everything else from outside the box. So what is the black stuff uh, which gives shape to the box if the box is the only thing in the universe? What are we going to call that? And yeah, that's where the word counter space is, how it entered the lexicon, okay? And, um, okay, now, yeah, let me show you this. Now, this is, this is uh, what they've done. Uh, you're inside, remember, you're inside the balloon, okay? And here's space, and sp counter space is what's outside of it, and that's you in the center, okay? So now you're going to blow the balloon up. The balloon's going to grow on you, and watch the curvature. What, what happens to the curvature? So it gets flattened out until you divide space in half. The bottom is space. What is the top? It's the counter space. Make sense? Okay, so now you know what counter space is, at least from a geometric point of view or from a, you could say, physical point of view. But it doesn't stop there. That's one aspect. That's you could call the geometric notion. Of counter space but that's not how Kenny uses it he, he might include it in there uh, because he mixes a lot of concepts into one without defining very precisely very crisply what he's talking about so uh, he goes in there and you look at the book right and he defines in many places defines <laughs> that's a big word for him he, he, he gives a hint of what he's talking about in many places he doesn't have a definition but this is what he has okay this is what uh, and I only looked at a quarter of his book because it's just simply unreadable. It's just an, a monster. It's, it's idiocy to the 10th power, okay? So he says counter space equal ether. So he's saying that ether and counter space are exactly the same thing. Okay, I, I could have saved myself the trouble just by looking up ether, but it turns out he doesn't define ether either. But he says the ether is counter space and cannot be in space. Rather, space is within the ether. Whatever nonsense that means. Counter space, the ether. Again, he equates them. Counter space or inverse space or negative space. What the hell is negative space? Dielectricity is counter space. Great. You know, uh, we're understanding a lot. Counter space is literally the space between space itself. What the hell can he possibly be saying? Okay. Uh, especially when he says, you know, that uh, space is within the ether. And now he says space uh, is between, uh, the counter space is literally the space between space itself. Okay, so he, he's got all kinds of contradictions here. The very omnipresent membrane, he's talking about the membrane of the ether. He's treating the ether as a membrane, okay? And ether being counter spatial, dielectricity is counter spatial, magnetism is spatial. That's the kind of uh, definitions that you will find in his book. That's the understanding you'll get of counter space in his book. What does he really do in his video? 
let me show you. Let's show that again. Let's see if I can get it uh, back in there. Where was it? Uh, here, uh, I think it's this one. No, wrong one. Uh, where was it? Um, I lost it. Anyways, uh, sometimes I get so many of these in there, it's very hard sometimes to look them up. Uh, I think it's this one. Let's see. Maybe it's this one. Uh, where is it? Yeah. See, he, he just says counter space. And so he, he shows a line. So he's showing the motion along one of the uh, lines of force. And he calls that a counter space whatever that means. So, you know, he's, he's using it in different contexts here, and he never defines it, of course. And he said, look, one of these lines is counter space because it goes against something else that's coming from over there. So counter space is the opposite of whatever's coming from the other side. That's one notion that he's got, okay? And he's got all these definitions. He says it's the ether, and the ether is everything. And what do you mean the ether? Yeah, because there's different modalities of the ether. He, over here, the ether turns into, you know, a flaming bush. And over here, he becomes love. And over there, he becomes, you know, uh, the spirit of God. So he's got all these notions of, of what the ether is, what the ether does. It's a magical substance that turns into everything. And you say, well, what is the ether? And so we're going to get to that probably on uh, Wednesday. But the point is, counter space is a word that he doesn't define. And uh, why is that important? Because he's going to use that counter space to explain magnetism. And here his so-called explanation of magnetism. It won't get any better than this, okay? So if you have something better to do, then don't do it. Listen to this. You'll love it, okay? This is, his, this is on, the, uh, on his video on the Internet explaining, explaining magnetism, okay? This is how it is, okay? So uh, read it carefully. He says... An enormous electrical charge is put through these in their creation. And they're talking about the magnets, how they were made, okay? Uh, you know, they're, they're put through these electrical charges. Fine. What that does is it creates field incommensurability. He likes that word. He uses it every two seconds because he knows nobody understands it. That's why he uses it. He deliberately puts it in there because he knows no one can follow him at that point. He says, see, I'm so smart and you're so dumb. You really got to, you know, go up there and do a little research to know what I'm talking about because this is, this is really kindergarten stuff for me. And that way he looks like a god in front of, you know, his uh, followers. And he says, incommensurability in this special conjugate geometry. Again, all these words that are not only meaningless, but irrelevant and unnecessary. Exactly like this. Do you see the two hyperbolas? Yeah, I see the two hyperbolas there in his picture. Okay, fine. Now, in our gyroscopic analogy, before a magnet is actually created, imagine trillions and trillions of little gyroscopes with their flywheels. Okay, flywheel is the uh, uh, spinning part of a gyroscope. Okay, that's what he's referring to. Okay, now here comes uh, in, in red, the one that's in red, here comes his explanation for magnetism. Okay, listen carefully. What happens is all those trillions and trillions of ferrous magnetodielectric geometries line up. Okay, so far we have a description. They line up. We don't know why they line up, what causes them to line up. It just says they do. That's a description. And what we have is perfect field incommensurability. Oh, that big word in there. Where magnetism is conjugating centrifugally and centripetally and the entire magnetic mass is acting in unison. Even if you knew what conjugating and what, what centrifugally and centripetally and incommensurability mean, perfectly defined and field also, even if you knew what each one of those words perfectly is, it means, this is only a description. There's no explanation in there. He's not telling you the cause of magnet, what's, what's, uh, what the mechanism is. You still don't know how the car runs. All you know is that gas is going into the motor. That's all you know. But you don't know how the car runs, how, how that compels the uh, wheels to move in a car. That's, that's what's happening here. This is only a description. And I like what, what he continues there. He said, if you don't know what incommensurability is, like you stupid moron, you know, you might need to Google it to understand it. It goes all the way back to Pythagoreans. It has to do with the golden ratio, whatever all that nonsense is. Now there are, and then he continues with another description talking about numbers and about angles. And then he says, so I hope you understand things a little bit better now. <laughs> 
absolutely love this guy. <laughs> uh, did you understand everything? Okay. <laughs> uh, Kenny Wheeler is a used car salesman. He's the worst kind, you know. He 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 collects not you know people who don't have much of a brain, like you know the charlatans of uh, of religion do, of traditional religions do. You know all these uh, Terry Falwells and uh, you know uh, uh, with Jimmy Bakers and Jimmy Schwaggers. All these guys they collect a lot more people than than. Uh, than uh, Ken. I mean, if, if Ken wants to really just make money, he should go into into religion. I mean, formally, he should really dedicate his time to Buddhism. Maybe he's going to get more money, more more suckers out there. Who is it? P.T. Barnum said, uh, suckers born every day. <laughs> and yeah, he's got a lot of suckers, 185,000 suckers that follow him. Fine, you know, I mean, he's, he's uh, uh, making money off of them, some money, uh, I don't know how much, but, Surely, I don't think he's got a jet in his garage, you know, like all these other, uh, uh, you know, pastors, these uh, uh, charismatic pastors, you know, who sell garbage to the masses. And what uh, what Kenny is doing is selling garbage. Uh, he, he, you know, I mean, just look at his book. You can, the book is free online. In fact, let me just tell you a little anecdote. Uh, when he contacted me, you know, in uh, five years ago, um, he told me his book was for free, and so I went in there and downloaded it. And I just downloaded it and never looked at it in my life I, until now. I looked at it in the last three days. And now he's got a new version. Still, my name's not in there, neither is the rope model, okay, so you won't find that in there. He does have my quotes and my little pictures, okay, fine. And uh, for me, it's not offensive. It's quite the contrary. I, I'm glad that he found use for them and that it helps his case. No problem there. I absolutely have no problem. And I'm glad he doesn't give me credit because I don't want anyone associating my theory with his. And so in that sense, we're, we're on the same, you know, uh, page, okay? Uh, I'm glad in that sense. But it just tells you something about his character, okay? <laughs> he's a devious guy. He, he's trying to make money. Okay, fine. You know, I, I can understand that too. I'm worried about his suckers. Uh, all those people who say, oh, you know, they, they gawk. And one of the reasons they gawk, let me tell you why. He does experiments online in front of your eyes. And there's a lot of people out there who say, oh, science is about doing experiments. And so they confuse doing experiments with explaining experiments. Those are two different things. Science is about explaining experiments. Doing experiments, that's technology. And so what, what uh, Kenny does, he goes in there, he does a flashy show. He says, look at this. And he does something flashy that people say, ooh, ah, look at that. Love it. Ooh, what, a, what a special effect. Uh, Hollywood should borrow this stuff. But he never explains it. He describes it using these fancy words, incommensurability, and just a puction, and who knows, whatever word he invents there, he never defines either in his book or online. And all he did was describe. He never explains it. He doesn't explain the mechanism. And I'll prove it to you. I'll, I, I challenge all those 185,000 followers of his, just one of any of them who wants to get a million bucks, you know, just to contact me and uh, say, look, I can explain to you how a magnet works. Let me show you the mechanism, the physical mechanism. And of course, they won't be able to. They won't be able to first because they don't understand his language because he hasn't defined the terms. Second, you know, even if they did understand the language, all they would have is a description, not an explanation, not a mechanism. And so you say, what are all these dummies doing following this, this, uh, this, he's not even charismatic, uh, because uh, I, there are a lot more people who are charismatic than, than good old Ken Wheeler. But, um, but he's a charlatan. That's all he is. He's a embezzler. That's all he is. And uh, so, yeah. Uh, you know, if you're going to be a follower of him, fine, that's, that's your prerogative. You can, you can follow anyone you want. You can follow, you know, uh, Jimmy Schwager if you want. You know, if you believe that he, he, you know, he sinned and then he repented and then he sinned again just in case, you know, and this is more or less the same thing. Anyways, on Wednesday, I'm going to continue with analyzing a little more of some of the words, especially the words, the language that Kenny has invented. And you're going to see that first if you download his book, Okay, 
Um, let's see if I have it there so that you get the name of it again in case you want to really look for it. Unless he pulls it down before you. Uh, here it is. Um, uh, it's called Uncovering the Mis Missing Secrets of Magnetism. And it's a book that if you look it up on, you Google it, uh, you can go in there and uh, download it. It's for free. He gives it away for free. And no, and I'll tell you no wonder why. <laughs> it, it, it should uh, uh, surprise you because it's worthless garbage. That's why. It's it's just nonsense. You, you won't be able to make it for past the 10 pages, the first 10 pages. It's just utter nonsense. And uh, he just uses fancy words that he's never defined. But you can download it and, you know, go for yourself. Uh, you know, look at it for yourself. And look up some of these words, counter special. See if you can find a, a precise, crisp definition. Look at incommensurate or incommensurability or any of those, you know, derivatives. He doesn't have a definition for anything, absolutely anything. And so that's what I'll continue with on Wednesday. So we'll see you then. And have fun. Have a good weekend. Bye. <laughs>